I really feel very passionate about trying to help first responders to find a, a middle ground between the two extremes, you know, where there is an option to find ways to manage the release and manage the experience internally without being so flooded that they can't they can't manage and they can't do their job because first and foremost they need to be able to go to work and stay safe and come home. Welcome back to the You Need a Counselor podcast. This is a show presented by Heart and Solutions Counseling Agency. We release new episodes every Sunday at 5 p.m. Central and encourage you to batch up that laundry, put away the dishes, plan for the week ahead, or do any other task that might seem daunting while you give our show a listen. You might just be encouraged to call your therapist, connect with this week's guest, or seek out those services you've been considering for a while but haven't made the commitment to yet. If you are in the state of Iowa and are in need of mental or behavioral health counseling, give us a call at 1-800-531-4236. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome back to the You Need a Counselor podcast. My name is Dr. Julie Johnson. I am the president and founder here at Heart and Solutions in Iowa. And I'm Krista Hunt. I am the vice president in charge of our behavioral health department at Heart and Solutions. And this is our podcast, You Need a Counselor. So we are designed for people curious about counseling that have barriers keeping them from experiencing the benefits of counseling. Our mission is to share stories about counseling, good, bad, and indifferent, and spread the message that everyone can benefit from mental health and behavioral health counseling services. Our guest today joins us from Maryland, and we've got Katie Bingner here with us today. Now, Katie is a licensed mental health therapist. She is also a communications coach, and she is a board-approved clinical supervisor, so she can do supervision for other therapists and other clinicians within her state as well. Uh, She is certified to do that continuing education for other therapists and other behavioral health counselors in her state uh, and does many, many different trainings, public speaking. She's got a blog on her website uh, and she's got tons of uh, services available on her website before you even start (laughs) the counseling process. So uh, uh, just a wealth of uh, really great resources there on the website before you even get to start to meet Katie. Um, So we are very, very excited to have you here, Katie. Thank you so much for joining us. I so appreciate you guys having me. Thanks. This is great. So now what is a communication coach? We, We have had mental health therapists, we have had money coaches, we have had uh, relationship coaches. What is a communication coach? Such a good question. I get asked that often. Um, So I, in my evolution as a therapist and kind of trying to find my path and what really feels the most fulfilling for me when I do my work is I, I love teaching people how to communicate more effectively. And so for my communication coaching services, it's really focused on helping individuals improve their ability to communicate in the important relationships in their life. And so that could be with their partner, that could be with their children, that could be with their immediate family and like their parents. Um, But it also could be just finding more success at work and being able to be more interpersonally effective at work. So I really want to kind of highlight for people that we don't need to wait for another person to learn how to communicate better. We can learn how to communicate better and and kind of empower ourselves to start making some shifts in the dynamics of our relationship through communication. And so, you know, I try to highlight with people over the years of doing clinical counseling, it's always been so fascinating to watch when a client of mine really learns how to communicate more effectively. And they come back and they say, it worked. (laughs) Like, I don't know why, but I just said the thing that we, that we worked on. And then this person who I, you know, typically fight with or, or don't feel heard by or whatever, it just, it felt different. And the dynamics can start to change just by one person changing their approach to the relationship. And so I really love highlighting that and 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 giving people hope that they can empower themselves to make changes in their relationships and even if the other person doesn't want to change or doesn't change we put ourselves in a more capable space of being able to say all right so i actually have options and i can communicate my boundaries better now 
and still find a way to facilitate a healthier relationship. So that's, that's what I do for communication coaching. So do clients usually come to you for counseling and then end up doing both communication coaching and counseling? Are they separate services that you do or are they usually combined? That's a really good question. Um, so essentially how it works it, um, it, in the U.S. here, coaching is not regulated. So um, when it comes to really being very careful about my licensure, which is regulated, and I, you know, have a particular set of, you know, legal and ethical um, standards to uphold. Uh, so the way that I work is that I let people know, if I've never worked with you, we can do a consultation, and we can kind of figure out which avenue feels like the right one for you. If it's just communication coaching, which appeals to people who have particular views or ideas about therapy where they're like, I'm not really interested or ready or wanting to go down that path, but I do want to learn how to communicate better with my partner. So it's like an option where we don't have to uncover all the past and really root through all the the deeper stuff. We can really just be more skills-based and it's more short-term and people really like that sometimes. Um, if we go down the therapy path, I, I try to explain to clients, once we go down there, we don't go back. So I can't do coaching with anybody who I've ever been a therapist to. Um, but cool thing is, is that I, I mean, I offer all my skills. I, you know, when, when we're in therapy together, I, I use everything available I have to help you. So I will also offer you those techniques and those, that education and those, um, skills training, um, you know, gifts to, to be able to fill out whatever it is that you want to get out of therapy. But, um, but yeah, so I hope that that was, I hope that answers your question. Well, absolutely. I, I, I like the metaphor of, you know, it's kind of a, it's a one way <laughs> street. It's a one way merge. Um, and I, uh, and, but when you're, when we're doing uh, mental health counseling, we're utilizing our, our tools for uh, helping with communication and healthy uh, boundaries and healthy relationships. And uh, we, we do a service called BHES, Behavioral Health Intervention. And uh, it's kind of a similar path where, uh, you know, a lot of times a, a BHES counselor, a behavioral health counselor will graduate to become a therapist and become licensed in our state. And you can move from behavioral health intervention into therapy, but you cannot go backwards because in therapy, we're utilizing behavioral health intervention, uh, but we are also doing uh, other things that are more regulated um, by the states and by our boards. So uh, very similar there. And I like that kind of one way uh, metaphor there. And as you're talking about communication, I'm thinking, gosh, I can I can definitely see where uh, people might feel more comfortable sometimes uh, with, okay, I want to work on my communication because my communication is not identity necessarily. There are going to be identity pieces wrapped up in my communication. Uh, there are certain people that I talk to differently than other people uh, kind of based on my role with that person. So I talk to my daughter differently than I talk to Chris, hopefully, right? So we we have uh, our communication kind of changes based on our relationship. And a lot of that is tied in with identity, but not as much as some of the other uh, goals and challenges and things that we might be doing and, and working through in therapy. There's There's kind of a separateness that we can have with communication as something that I'm doing. It's not necessarily something that I am. Um, and it's something that I can, I have control over. So uh, there's so much, so challenging for us as humans when we've got relationship strain and we feel like, well, I can't change what that person does. I can't change how that person responds to me. I can be very sweet and they can roll their eyes at me. Uh, there are, I can't change that. And, uh, and your stance coming in with, with these clients and being able to say, yeah, we, we can't <laughs> like, we literally cannot 
change how that person responds to the way that we're communicating currently. We can change how that person responds to us as an individual. Um, and that's through the way that we're communicating. So if Krista and I are always making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, <laughs> I can't change that Krista is still going to be peanut butter, but I can make that sandwich a peanut butter and banana sandwich um, by changing yeah. what I do. Uh, so I just love the kind of the focus on communication as behavioral because there's power in that and uh, and the identification that everything is communication. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the way that somebody, the way that I sit my coffee cup, right, can be, I could be communicating a lot to my husband <laughs> right at that moment, <laughs> by the way, I'm drinking that coffee. Uh, and so everything that we do, um, and when we boil it down, every behavior that we take, whether we brush our hair in the morning, right? Whether we put on shoes in the morning to go out the door, um, all of that is communication uh, that we're doing. So I just think it's so important what you're doing and, and what you're focusing in on. Um, and I just love that you're out there doing that work. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, you know, when I really started to make this shift and I narrowed in on, you know, what do I really, really love doing and really want to kind of ramp up in my work. And when I figured out that the communication piece was it, um, and I, I mentioned to you guys earlier that my wife is a police officer. And one of the things that really comes to my mind, you were mentioning, Julie, is that there are certain people in this world who, for many reasons, um, the idea of therapy is really threatening. It, it doesn't feel safe. And um, I wanted to offer an option for change that felt safer, you know, and, and I, um, so I have a close connection to, you know, first responders and that community and just understanding that there's so many first responders who um, feel really unsafe at the idea of even suggesting therapy. And I get why. I I mean, we've been through our own journey personally, uh, 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 you know, for that. And so I understand why. And I thought, well, instead of trying to like convince <laughs> them <laughs> to go to therapy, what if I just like could also offer people an option that felt more manageable and um, and could potentially be a bridge to therapy, but doesn't have to be. It, it, it winds up really emphasizing someone's autonomy in terms of you know, wanting to make change in their life, but not having the only option be to dive in to all of it, the dive into the deep end, so to speak. Yeah. Um, can you give some examples of what to expect from like your first coaching session or what people can expect when they first start services with you? Absolutely. So I do a consultation with everyone that's free and um, we go through kind of what it is that you feel like you need, what it is that you're looking for, what are your, you know, maybe some vague goals. And that's where we will determine if coaching is the right path. And if not, like I'm there, I, I'm just always dedicated to making sure that if you're reaching out to me for help and I'm not quite the right fit for whatever reason, I'm going to assist you in trying to get you to the next person that could be a better fit. But if it does turn out that communication is the way to go and uh, we want to start coaching, our first session is going to look like a focus on goal setting and really specific to what would be some realistic goals to set for whatever's going on in your life right now. And I have kind of two options, people kind of two tracks that people can um, sign up for. You can just do the kind of booking as you go. And for those who kind of just want like um, spot treatment, so to speak, <laughs> you know, like um, things are mostly good, but we keep fighting about this one thing and it keeps randomly popping up and I want to be able to like work through that with you. Um, uh, we can do that or we can do more of like a, um, like a package session where the package deal, where we do like, um, six sessions in eight weeks. And we identify at least one very specific goal that we are going to do everything to work toward achieving by the end of those eight weeks. And with that package, you actually get a session for free. So you pay for five and you get six. And this is, uh, the coaching piece could be anybody then. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and is therapy limited to Maryland or do yes. you do uh, other? Okay, wonderful. So, I mean, that's another way that coaching is uh, helping you reach other people 
that exactly. you might not otherwise be able to see. Wonderful. So what got you interested in uh, in working with um, with clients for therapy and also what got you interested in mostly in communications? You know, so in regard to getting into therapy um, as a clinician, um, I always, I kind of tell people that I took the detour in, in my career, which I am proud of now. <laughs> but um, earlier on and, you know, when I was younger, I wanted to be an actor and um, that evolved from doing some acting to then becoming a licensed massage therapist in Maryland. And I did that for eight years. But it was interesting because like kind of every time I was just like right at the end of each little path, it very it became very clear to me which turn to take. And so I was like, I don't know what else I'm going to do. I I'm, I want to finish my degree, but acting is not the way to go for me. OK, I'll I think I'm going to I think I'm going to go become a massage therapist. And then right when I was finishing up school for massage therapy, I was like, I think I want to go into psychology. <laughs> And so I used um, massage therapy to basically work my way through my um, my bachelor's and my master's degree. And uh, I've just always been very, very driven to try and understand understand people and and kind of humanness and um, human nature. And that's evolved over the years as well. Um, I think there's a deeper sense of curiosity, not just wanting to get people, not just wanting to kind of figure people out, but also wanting to truly understand on a deeper level of curiosity and compassion. Um, and that's something that I've been able to cultivate really deeply um, from becoming a more trauma-informed therapist over the last few years. And then also I've, you know, been doing this for about nine years and I've experienced my own compassion fatigue and burnout through the process. And so it was really the communication coaching came in um, as a way to evolve even further in a more sustainable way for myself to say, okay, what really brings me the most joy? What really fulfills me? What are the sessions that I walk away from feeling energized rather than drained? And it was, it would come back to education and training and I just, I mean, when I talk about communication, <laughs> I really get excited. <laughs> I think it's hard for me to hide it, nor I don't want to, but it becomes very obvious to me that that's really where I get the most energy and fulfillment. And so that's really where I started to put the next pieces of the puzzle together for myself. And you mentioned earlier too, um, the first responders and their stigma with counseling and starting therapy and kind of doing that like coaching first. Um, can you kind of explain why you think that is that people in the first responder field have that stigma towards therapy? Yeah. Um, well, it's cultural for one thing. I mean, there's in the broader culture, there's been stigma around mental health and, and, um, emotional, uh, health and, getting care for that. And, um, that's only solidified in certain kind of subcultures and law enforcement and first responder cu culture is, is one of those cultures where it's even more, um, stigmatized. And I do think that there's been a little bit of a shift to improve that, but it's, you know, it's slow going and there's a lot, I think, to it. On one hand, I think there's a personal space of, of compartmentalization and probably learning how to kind of distance our, from emotions before even becoming a first responder. And that being one of the reasons why maybe that career appealed, um, because it is very much like we're in control. You know, we don't we don't need to be uh, kind of caught up in the mess of emotion. We can be very pragmatic and straightforward and, you know, in control. And um, I think that that's a part of it. And I think that also the trauma that comes with that work, which is inevitable, then makes our emotions even more difficult and can feel like even more of an enemy to an individual because trauma makes everything that much more heightened and that much more um, overwhelming. So then it just becomes, how am I going to keep doing my job if I get flooded? So it's just a further and further distancing from that internal activity and a, and a deeper um, 
strive to contain it and kind of repress it and just keep it under control. And of course, as you know, mental health providers, we understand that that isn't, that works, but it's not sustainable. And so I really feel very passionate about trying to help first responders to find a, a middle ground between the two extremes, you know, where there is an option to find ways to manage the release and manage the experience internally without being so flooded that they can't, they can't manage and they can't do their job because first and foremost, they need to be able to go to work and stay safe and come home. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we see a similar phenomenon with students, um, especially with all of the school violence that has been happening over the last, uh, gosh, decade now. Um, and we see a similar kind of response uh, to therapy in school sometimes uh, for high schoolers, especially because uh, there's this knowledge that, okay, well, I'm going to go into my session, but I got to go to geometry class right after this, um, you know? And so for first responders kind of similarly, well, I, I got to go to, I might be on call right now. Okay. And so I might get a phone call right now. Uh, I need to uh, be on my game and I need to be able to focus on what I'm doing because lives are at stake and the stakes are so high. And so um, the, that feeling of, well, if I let any of it go, it's all going to go. And then how, and if, if we haven't had the practice of putting those things back into our containers, putting them back up and sealing that up real fast uh, when we need to, <clears throat> then when we do it, it's going to be clunky. Um, you know, when my, when my daughter needs to put on her shoes for hip hop class, right. They're, they're lace up high top shoes. Uh, and so when she first started doing it, that was really challenging getting out the door. Uh, and now that she's seven and a half, she puts them on and we go. And so it's because she's had the practice of doing that um, and going, okay, I'm going to lace this up real quick and then I'm going to be tied and, and out the door and on my way. And uh, for, for first responders, especially, it takes practice of that skill uh, over time to be able to say, okay, I can leave all of this at my therapy session. I can leave all of this, uh, you know, in my therapist's office or on that Zoom call with, with my therapist and I can uh, zip it up and go do the job that I need to do. Um, and that's that's a very difficult uh, muscle to build without the experience of doing it. And in order to get the experience, it takes so much trust that, that we can zip back up and that we can create and hold that container of space in our sessions uh, and that that container is strong enough to withhold uh, these these emotions or these thought processes to uh, impede my work outside. So I, I, I think it's such a, this half step that you do with communication, it's a way to start practicing that. It's a way to start building that muscle and going like, well, yeah, I can talk about my argument with my sister, right? Like I can talk about that all day long, right? Because uh, a lot of times to that, um, a lot of times that uh, anger feeling or that resentment feeling is easier to talk about. And so when I'm talking about, okay, I had a fight with my sister, you won't believe what she said to me, right? We're talking about communication, but it, it gives me, the opportunity to practice putting that argument with my sister back into my container so that I can go out and uh, address the next fire that's happening. Exactly. It's it's this idea of keeping people more so in their uh, prefrontal cortex, their, their kind of thinking brain, because that's really where the communication piece lights up and, and giving them an option to kind of modulate and not get too close to that kind of lower brain activation that I think one of those misconceptions about first responders is that there's a choice being made most of the time. And, and I do think that it appears like it's a conscious choice, but there's so much nervous system change and there's so much conditioned behavioral response that is not an active decision, but it is really just 
what their body and their system has become conditioned to do in response to any perceived danger. And what I think a lot of times doesn't get understood is that when they come home, different things then are perceived as danger, like fighting with our partner feels like potential death. And that's how our, at least their system responds to it. And so they then respond typically how they would at work. And there becomes this spillover effect that um, that really needs to be addressed. And a part of that can really be addressed, at least in the beginning, by communication training. And, and again, yeah, giving them that opportunity because they're so trained on the other side of that coin, like you were saying, Julie, there's a skill that needs to be built, right? Muscle needs to be built. Your daughter learned to tie her shoes, you know, and now it's just muscle memory, And what we don't necessarily take into account is that everything that a first responder is doing on the job becomes muscle memory. And it's so automatic that to to think about then flipping the coin on the other side and building a new muscle that is not only hard to build, but feels very threatening to the other side. It's very opposite of what feels safe. And so it, it's, it's a process and, um, and it can improve, but it's very understandable why it feels so difficult and why it is so difficult to do. Can you give us some examples of reasons that clients do reach out wanting those coaching, uh, communication, communication, coaching, what are some of their like big issues that they specifically reach out to you for? Um, so far it's typically been the, the dynamic between them and their partner. Um, that's usually the thing that drives people to ask for help, right? That's what pushes people into couples counseling. Um, and it's typically when people are feeling really helpless or at a loss. And so it's kind of like our communication is crap and we keep fighting over the same thing over and over and over again. And there's this element of, of when we don't know how to communicate effectively, we, default to what we have been doing, even though it's not working. We just kind of solidify, we dig down, we double down into what we know to be right. Um, even though it's not working. And so typically people are reaching out and asking for help in that regard because they've realized that this is not working. (laughs) There's something happening here. And, um, and oftentimes I do have people, frame it at first, like, well, my partner X, Y, Z, it's a very kind of other blame situation where it's like, you know, they make me fill in the blank. And so it's a, so it's a bit of a process in terms of sometimes really helping people bring focus back to what they can control to their responsibility and their role and how they participate. And that can be tough for some people, but at the end of the day, um, I really try to kind of, I try to meet people where they're at, but I try to be very honest about the reality that, um, a dynamic requires at least two. And so since we don't have your partner here and we don't have the capacity to do any change on that end, we're going to want to focus on you and where you can find your power to make these changes and just help yourself feel better about the situation. Help yourself walk away knowing that you did it differently and that different was better than what you'd done before. And that's, that's pretty powerful just in and of itself. Yeah, absolutely. It's very empowering uh, to look at ourselves and look at where we do have control um, and to be able to acknowledge the places that we don't. And uh, I wonder, uh, it, I mean, you bring such a great perspective here on that first responder stigma uh, for mental health. And I wonder, uh, is there something to, or do you notice ever a pattern um, where certain kinds of professions where we might be uh, high action, there might be high adrenaline, um, the stakes are very high, uh, these kinds of, um, of positions and, and activities that we're doing, Do you find that because we have to give up so much control in order to do that, if I'm an EMT, I need to follow procedure, like to the letter when I am on that ambulance, I need to go down that checklist and I need to, I cannot go based off of what I necessarily think or feel 
in that moment. So I might have a three-year-old child in front of me and I might be having all kinds of feelings because I have a three-year-old at home and I need to go down that checklist and I need to. So the conditioning that you talked about that becomes so automated um, in these kinds of roles, uh, because we've got to give up so much control uh, when we're doing that. And because there are so, a fire is not a controllable thing. And, you know, and they teach that actually to, to that it's, it's not, you can, you can uh, manage, right? But it's fire is not controllable. Um, and uh, other people are, when we're a police officer, other people are not controllable. Uh, having to give up so much of that uh, power and control in those situations, um, does that ever come into how the rea how people react to the counseling space when now it's time for us to make changes based on who we are versus our roles and what we've been programmed to do. It's an interesting question. When you were talking, one of the things that um, came up in my mind was some of the conversations I've had with first responders. And it's interesting because part of the, I think part of the conditioning is that they're, they're perceiving these situations as controllable in the in regard to the scaffolding and the structure that they've been taught right so like i hear that they lean into all those pieces that allow them to feel in control so that they can stay focused on doing what needs to be done to regain control right so you're right there's pure chaos when they enter the scene but their role is to get that scene under control, whatever their role might be, you know, it, whether it's EMT, law enforcement, firefighter, you know, dispatch. And so that's, I think, a big part of how they perceive the situation is like they're going in to establish control and their strengths lie in the problem solving element. They're, you know, again, they're fascinating in terms of the nervous system change that occurs because for most of us, when we enter into a situation that could be life-threatening, clearly life-threatening, we have a very common, right, like fight, flight, freeze type of response that um, is supposed to keep us safe. But sometimes, you know, <laughs> it winds up in, in panic. And for them, they've conditioned their nervous system to do the opposite, to not panic, right? To stay controlled, to maintain control. And then I think to kind of translate that control outward to whoever is in front of them, whatever the situation is. And so when they enter into treatment, and you, because you had asked specifically about treatment, um, one of the things that I think is useful is leaning into the strengths that they already have and they already feel comfortable with to help ease into that process of what is it going to be like to consider being more vulnerable, which does feel like giving up control. And what are the resources we can offer someone who is in this um, situation, in that experience where giving up control feels absolutely unmanageable? What are the resources that we could teach them and give them so that they can kind of keep tethered to a sense of control, even through the chaos? And I think that is relatable to them is, you know, how on scene it's pure chaos, but you trust your training. You rely back on you and your colleagues to stay tethered to control, kind of giving them almost a, a metaphor like that to see it like we're going to we're going to kind of do the same thing. We're going to give you ways to maintain some control throughout this process and also we're going to touch on the edges of some of the chaos and just do that bit by bit at their pace. How long is someone typically in coaching services with you? Like how long does it take to kind of break through that with them and let go of some of that control. I know you mentioned like they can have six sessions. Do they typically continue services after that? You know, it really just depends on the individual, like with therapy. But um, but one thing that I think appeals more to people when the co with the coaching is that it does really lean into those strengths. You know, when people are more interested in coaching than therapy, sometimes it's because it's that idea of 
I want to fix this, right? That that sense of like, I need some skills so I can get some of this stuff under control. And it really does speak to that. And so some of the stuff that's already comfortable um, to them, some of the approaches to problem solving, uh, we're taking a problem solving approach when we're doing coaching. And so it really depends on kind of how um, the person reacts to the coaching and and how they react to the potential of change. Because that's the one thing that I think prolongs the work is when we kind of understand that under the problem solving can be the reality of change. And that can mean longer work because, well, we've got to be ready for the change or at least willing for the change to happen in order to make it happen. Otherwise it won't. And the, and the work will get kind of paused or, or um, detoured a bit. Yeah. What I like about that is that it really is so customized to where that person is in their journey and uh, their comfort level and their, where they are in their life at that time too, uh, because sort of we go through seasons of life where these are very, very helpful, important, things. and we go through seasons of life where we we are just in survival mode, and we are going, you know, and so it's it's taking advantage of those times in our lives where we go, okay, I can focus on myself, I can focus on improving these things in my life uh, through for the long term uh, for these long term challenges, as opposed to. Uh, that feeling of, okay, I'm in survival mode. And so everything needs to be fixed, right? I need to fix that. I need to fix this. I need to fix that versus this, this long-term process um, of healing for, for the long run. I think that is beautiful. And you had a negative counseling experience uh, in your early twenties and I, uh, and it really, it sounds like shaped how you look at counseling, how you do counseling, how you uh, help train other counselors, um, and in how you do your coaching. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I. Um, it's a really important um, topic, actually, for me, because um, when it comes to being a clinician, a licensed clinician, we all to some degree, it varies state by state, but we all to some degree have some requirements in terms of mandated reporting. Um, and that just means that if somebody reports to us any um, current or past um, abuse of a child, an elder, a vulnerable adult, um, we have to report that to to local um, authorities, um, CPS or whatever your department would be in your area. And um, that is a that is, I think, one of the trickiest, most complicated things for a cl clinician to navigate. Um, and for now, for me, I've only ever worked with it. So on my end of it, it's always been an adult reporting past abuse that in here in Maryland, we actually were required to still report that even if the abuse happened decades ago. And even if the abuser is deceased, we are required by law to make a report. Um, and I think we don't get enough training. In fact, I didn't get any training um, in effective trauma-informed mandated reporting. Uh, and when I was in my first therapy relationship. This was way before I thought about going into psychology. And um, I was in my early 20s, like you said, and um, I was working on codependency. I was um, struggling with the relationship that I was in and noticing that kind of like how we were just talking about <laughs> so many people who come into therapy. I was one of those people who, I, you know, it was like very capable, competent, fixing, you know, like, tell me how to fix this. And um and I had established a pretty decent rapport with this clinician. And I have never, now just preface, I, I did experience um, sexual trauma as a child. And so um, I brought that into a session and I had never reported that before. I had never kind of disclosed, quote unquote, um, that before. And this was my first therapy session, but I didn't have a problem talking about it. It was 
to me at the time, I remember it being um, an aside. It was like kind of just like anecdotal to the point that I was trying to make or the story or or the the struggle that I was trying to convey. And um, all at once, things changed in the session. And before I knew it, I was on a phone call with CPS and being interviewed um, by the CPS agent. And that took a long time to kind of process and really understand what had happened because that was a re-traumatization for me. I had no idea that was going to happen. It was not clearly explained to me that if certain details are reported, um, this would have to move in a direction of it being reported. I was not given an option to have the therapist report it or myself. I I, I really had I lost all my autonomy in that moment. And I think that the clinician at the time, um, like so many clinicians, I think that they were probably taken over by fear and concern and anxiety when um when someone across from us re- tells us something that we now feel that we have like this legal mandate to do something about, otherwise we're we're, we're gonna get in trouble. And it becomes no longer about the client in front of you. And it really becomes about our trauma response, about our fear response. And that's pretty much what happened for me um, and to me. And I don't know if, um, you know, I'm I'm sure um, people listening and you guys have done at least one report um, and they are invasive to say the least. They are very structured and invasive. And I had no way of preparing for answering the questions that I was asked. And I remember going on autopilot and it was very much a dissociative experience where I was, I was a good, I I was a good girl. I did what I was told. I answered all the questions and there were some repercussions that, that kind of lasted a while. So that is an experience that I really take to heart and have in my own clinical work been very, very my I've been on my own journey. And believe me, in the beginning, I that's why I have empathy for this clinician because I I know what it feels like to feel the anxiety of um I, I can't do anything wrong. If I do something wrong, I'm gonna get in trouble. And I'm gonna go through these steps, these procedural steps to make sure I don't get in trouble. But um but I've been able to develop a much more trauma-informed approach when it comes to mandated reporting. And it's something that's very important to me um, to also share with clinicians and, and here today. Yeah. Uh, what advice do you have for clinicians that might be listening, like when they do have to make a mandated report? Because I mean, I'm sure like you said, she probably was like scared and had no idea what to do. And I think sometimes people act out of that fear, like you were saying, and don't think about the appropriate way <laughs> to make the report. So what advice do you give providers listening? So the approach that I take, and again, I I put this under the lens of a trauma-informed approach, is um, I prioritize the person in front of me first and foremost. So at the very, very beginning, when we talk about informed consent with our clients, you know, I highlight the mandated reporting process, and I really take some time to explain some of the nuance of it so that they understand that they're going to be in charge of what they share with me. And therefore, they're going to be in charge of kind of the process that follows. And also, if I start to notice that they're going down a road verbally that is like getting close to, there's going to be some information that's probably about to come out that I'm going to have to report without a choice on my end. I pause them and I tell them I'm going to pause them. I tell them I'm going to interrupt you probably. So I apologize in advance. (laughs) But it's because I want you to be able to make a very mindful choice. I'm going to remind you this is kind of territory that's getting a little bit potentially mandated reporting territory. And I want you to be able to mindfully decide if I share this information, I know that the next steps are going to be some kind of report is going to have to be made and that there are some options for how to make that report. But do I want to move forward with that step? That's very important. Um, and I think that that is 
really, really important, especially if maybe you know a little bit of detail. Like if you know that this person, the abuser is dead, right? You know that they're definitely not abusing anyone else right now. Then then that really, it's kind of a gradient for me. And so like that's at the top of the list of like, I want the client to 100% know that this does not have to happen. They don't have to, we don't have to go down that road and we can process this without using those details. And we can kind of tiptoe around this and keep you in a space that you feel safe and in control. If I get, if, you know, if I know that the person is still alive, then that's where I might start to ask a few more questions around like, do you have any concern that the person who hurt you could potentially be hurting other people? And, you know, I get an idea of where there's a potential current issue. And from there, I, I use my best clinical judgment in the situation um, to, to make a decision. But it's always, always with the client in mind, first and foremost, because we don't want to re-traumatize people. That's not effective. That doesn't help. And that is really what we're there first and foremost to do is to help this person in front of us. So there are ways. And, and I let people know, you know, you can leave whatever information you want. You can go. I can do the report on my own. I can give them a little bit of heads up based on my experience of what they maybe could expect. Like, for example, in Maryland, there's an attorney general um, report. It's back from the 90s that basically decided that even though we're mandated to report past abuse, even if the person's dead, even if it's been decades, they also aren't going to investigate that. And so it's a very interesting little knot that we get bound up in knowing that uh, we have to make this report to the law. And also the law says there will be no investigation. There will be there will be no action taken. So we really want to be mindful of the the cost of walking people through that process. Some, I have had this experience when I explain this very thoroughly to people, I've had some clients say, I want to do it. It's a part of their healing process. They decide that they want, you know, together we make the call in the same room and we're able to process that experience and it can be a very healing um, intervention. Um, but it's important that it's up to them. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, it's one of my favorite things about this, this podcast is that we can talk about these barriers for people coming into counseling. This is a really big fear for a lot of people, uh, you know, that if I go into counseling and I start talking, I might get a report against me. Uh, my, I might have to disclose something that then needs to be reported. And if we are not clear going into those sessions of what is the law in my state? What are the nuances of that law? What, and, and does my clinician understand what the law is in my state? And do they understand the nuances of, uh, of those requirements? Because, uh, you know, if, if I'm going in to a session with a new clinician and I'm concerned about this. And the thing is that sometimes people are concerned about this, but they don't even, they don't know what it specifically is. And I think that you sharing your experience really gives a voice to that, that really very real fear that people have about coming into counseling and, uh, and sharing because we we let ourselves go in a way, especially when we've got good rapport with our counselor, we let ourselves go in a way that it doesn't, it starts to feel safe, but overall, we're going, is this safe, right? So knowing what those potential landmines are, knowing what happens if I go down path A, if I go down path B, if I go down path C, what is at the end of that path and uh, and that helps me to determine, okay, my counselor, this counselor understands what those paths are. They have expressed to me that this is what will happen. And now I can make that informed decision myself. Um, and so having the power of knowing what those laws are in our own states 
is hugely uh, empowering. And, uh, and I would encourage anybody going to counseling, if your counselor does not bring up mandatory report, they should, <laughs> but they don't always. And if they don't bring it up to you, or if they kind of do the very brief, hey, if somebody's hurting you, if I, I'm going to have to report that, you have the power and the control in that session to say, I want to talk about what that means. I want to see that in writing, right? I want to, uh, I want to know how you interpret this law and this law and this regulation, um, because that's what's going to give us peace of mind about what is going to, uh, to happen with that clinician. Uh, and then we can be mindful of it. So, uh, there's a huge power in that, in knowing that ahead of time and going in there and being our own advocate as clients. Uh, because if a if the counselor that we're starting to meet with appears to have a very different interpretation or understanding of that law, uh, then we can know, okay, maybe this isn't the clinician that I want to work with, right? Maybe I want to work with somebody else who maybe uh, has a better has had more self-education on what these mandatory reporting rules are. Uh, so yeah, I just encourage everybody to, uh, to be in that driver's seat in those sessions and, uh, and let the experience that Katie is, is sharing about her own personal experience in counseling, let that help, help each of us to uh, be the drivers of our own sessions. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that Katie. Absolutely. You know, I was talking to a, a colleague this week um, about mandated reporting, not about this story, but about mandated reporting um, in a clinical consultation group. And she said something that really resonated and I think could resonate for um, for everyone listening. And that's, you know, we are we're mandated to report. We're not mandated to investigate. And that really resonated with me because it really touched on a very concise way of understanding what our role is. If we know the details of something, we have to share that information with the authorities, but we are not required to dig. We are not required to keep asking questions and, and getting all those details so that we then have to report. And, and that's a really fine line that I think would have been very helpful to know in in the beginning of my career when I did think that it was my job as a mandated reporter to to get those details um, and to ask those details and it's not absolutely you see it in uh, you know with our template sensed providers sometimes you know brand uh, new graduates and um, and sometimes there'll be some frustration there of well they won't they won't tell me. I know something's going on and they just won't tell me and we go, well, that's their right to not tell you. Um, I'm glad that they feel comfortable enough in that session to not tell you, uh, you know, yeah. what you suspect. So I absolutely, we see that uh, a fair amount. I think what you, um, what you address so often in this uh, interview is um, that that counselors and coaches are also humans and also have our own processes. We're also uh, triggered by certain events in those sessions. And so, um, you know, as a, as a potential client of therapy or coaching, uh, it's helpful to know that because then we can inform ourselves, we can armor ourselves um, with the information and make sure that we are going in there with the understanding that, yeah, we, this is a human person, right? They might not have all the information or all the answers. They might not pause me in my session to say, okay, we're, looks like you're headed towards uh, path C, right? Here's what's at the end of path C. There, there is a dragon at the end of path C, right? There's a butterfly at the end of path B. Where, where are we going, right? And so, uh, and because some people are going to be like, I'm getting that dragon, right? <laughs> like, that's where we're going. I'm slaying that dragon right now, right? And other people are like, no, I 
I don't want that. I'm going butterfly route, right? And neither is right or wrong. Um, but not every counselor is going to do that, is going to do the work of laying that out and kind of tracking where are we in regard to this. Um, and so with, armed with this information, though, um, and secondhand experience, we can arm ourselves uh, to be able to do that mapping. Wonderful. Well, uh, year coaching sessions, like we said, anybody can sign up, right? Um, and so any state uh, or any country, people can sign up on your website. I, I mean, yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, I haven't uh, considered really working uh, with people out of the country yet, but I guess that is, that's a potential option. Um, but anyone, yeah, in the country can can reach out and we can do a consultation if you're interested. I, I do want to offer the listeners um, here particularly uh, a discount. So uh, a nice little gift if you do decide to schedule with me. Um, I'm going to offer you $100 off your first coaching session. So be sure to mention that if you do fill out a consultation form uh, to schedule and uh, or at least mention it when we uh, consult. And yeah, you'll get uh, that extra little gift just for listening and, uh, and uh, reaching out to me. Wonderful. So uh, you can listen, you can find Katie at www.katie, K-A-T-I-E, Bingner, B-I-N-G-N-E-R. Um, I was, uh, I'll remember that last name because I'm a huge Friends fan. So as soon as I see Bing, I'm like, I hope it's pronounced Bing and it is. Um, so. And this is Chandler. Oh my oh goodness. My God. <laughs> Chandler Bingner. Chandler Bingner. That's so cute. That is Sorry. wonderful. I woke him up. Sorry, but I had to. Oh, he just made my day. <laughs> so nobody will forget Katie Bingner, uh, dot com. And uh, Katie, thank you so much for being here on the show today. We really, really appreciate it. I'm Katie Bingner and I need a counselor. And I'm Krista Hunt. And I'm Julie Johnson, and we need a counselor. And so do you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the You Need a Counselor podcast. We are so grateful that you're here. Now, we want to hear from you. Text us or give us a call at 515-650-3231. You can also find and connect with You Need a Counselor on Facebook and Instagram. If you've enjoyed today's show, please take a moment to like, review, or leave a comment as all of these things help others to find and benefit from the podcast as well. If you're in the state of Iowa and interested in mental health counseling or behavioral health intervention services, give us a call at 800-531-4236. And if you're a provider seeking play therapy CEUs, you can find us on patreon.com slash you need a training. We'll see you for the next episode Sunday at five.